Naked and poor, wretched and blind, I come. Clothe me in white so I won't be ashamed. Lord, light the fire again. You probably remember from an earlier talk that uh, God threatened to strip Israel bare. They had reached the point where they were like a slave to idolatry to the extent that they were so in the depths of sin that, well, that's probably all God felt he could do. I'm always overwhelmed by the gospel of grace which says that however we come to the Lord that he will accept us that he is the God who accepts us when we're far away and he longs for us to come back. The prodigal son, as people call that story that Jesus told, I think it is not a very good title because I think it's more accurately entitled The Loving Father. The Loving Father who looks out of his window down the road, day after day, longing, longing for his wayward son to come home. And that is exactly what happens in the story. When the son returns, he rejoices that he's reunited with his son. And whatever his son has done, squandered his inheritance with loose living, as I think Jesus says in the story. Whatever he's done, he welcomes the Son back. So ultimately, the gospel message is about people being welcomed back wherever they've been, however far they've fallen. I wonder if you've tried reading Hosea through, all the way through in one sitting. You know, I've hinted at it this uh, um, weekend. Um, I've done it several times, as I say, over the last couple of weeks. You know, it's very easy to get bogged down in chapters 4 to 10 in the poetry section. There's a lot of repetition. You know, a lot of people who've studied this book um, believe that Hosea, as we have it, was a compilation by someone else of Hosea's prophetic teachings, his Addresses, if you like. You know, it's a bit like getting of all all the speeches of a single-minded politician and publishing them in a book. I tried to think of somebody, that a politician, that wouldn't offend anybody as an example, but uh, I thought I'd choose somebody who might uh, offend you. But Nigel Farage, for example... Uh, If you've listened much to Nigel Farage's speeches, they're virtually always the same key points, as are most politicians, to be fair. But he is so single, he's been so single minded about the European Union that it's the same thing every time. And if you were to take his major speeches and publish them in a book, it would be a bit like these chapters, 4 to 10, of Hosea, because Hosea was single-minded about the message that God had given him about the unfaithfulness of Israel to their loving husband, their loving father, as children of God. He repeats himself in these chapters, but it's worth looking out for the major themes inspired by God and asking what do these things say to us today. And chapters 4 to 10 are a further exploration of the reason for Israel's unfaithfulness to God uh, and of course the results of that unfaithfulness. In chapter 4 verse 6, Hosea says that Israel has no knowledge or understanding of God. And God says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, 
I will also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. Now, we're not talking here about the sort of head knowledge one might learn um, by going to a college or by uh, learning uh, ideas by rote. What God is saying uh, repeatedly through these chapters is that most of the Israelites refuse to acknowledge him. We need to understand what's being said here because it's not just about knowing about Christianity. It's not just about the mind. This word knowledge in Hosea comes from the Hebrew word to know, yada. This word is not just knowing about God, but having a relationship with him. So it should say, in fact, my people are destroyed from lack of knowing me. That's what it should really say. You know, their religion had become a formality. They continued to worship God in the temple, but their hearts were not engaged. They were more engaged with the alternative lifestyles that was around their uh, alternative religion, the exciting Baal cult that had arisen, uh, a, a sort of place of naughtiness, really, that they were flirting with. You know, a comparison uh, today, I'll tr- try to think of a comparison in reality of how this might work, is for somebody who goes to church every Sunday morning and they want it over as soon as possible so that they can get home and get on with the rest of the day um, to, to use as they will. It might be that somebody goes to church on Sunday morning so that they can spend the afternoon getting ready for having a lovely evening joining the local coven of witches. Somebody said to me earlier on, there are more witches covens than churches in England. I don't know if that's true, but if it is true, and it... It sounds to me possibly true because there is an unbelievable interest in the occult around today. You only have to see all these posters for psychic fairs. I don't know if you've ever been one. I don't recommend it, by the way, but I've been to a few, uh, having been invited to go and observe. But loads of people go to it, and they think nothing of it. They think of it as harmless fun, whereas, in fact, really, it's a real doorway to danger. You know, there are lots of people today, even in our churches, who don't know God. They know about God, and they'll argue with you. They think they know about God. They can often have very strong opinions about God. Many of them have these opinions, not based on God's word, but on their own speculations about God. Many of those who actually read God's word know about God from it, but they don't know him. They don't have that relationship, engagement with him. You know, this was a problem in Hosea's time, and it's the problem we have today. I call it box-ticking syndrome. We attend worship to keep our hand in with God. We go through the motions, but really our heart is somewhere else, worshipping something else, valuing something else. God, what, he longed actually for his people to know him and believe him, like Abraham, like Moses, like David. But they just wanted church, or should I say temple, to be over as soon as possible so that they could go where the fun was. We need to ask ourselves, is that us? Are we putting God into second or third or fourth place in our lives? Now, it may be that there are lots of people in our churches, or some people anyway. Uh, I doubt if there's very many people at Christ Church who haven't experienced a true and living faith in Christ, actually. I, uh, looking at the church, it, it seems a church that is uh, a very much a church of faithful people. And I've encountered few people here 
who uh, I think probably haven't got it yet. But if we put other things ahead of our total commitment to God, on Sunday is worship our priority. And we know, don't we, uh, that... Uh, the pressures of modern family life. Goodness, I know it all too well with a daughter in Kent and a daughter in Kendall. You know, I know this all too well. And for most people who work Monday to Friday, it's very difficult, and they, they go off to see their family at the weekends. All that is very understandable. But actually, when we look across the Church of England at the statistics, there is a slide in attendance going on on Sunday. So people, instead of going every week, go every alternate week or, or one week in three they're not there or uh, some people only go once a month to join and worship with the other believers in their church. And in the same way, people don't make time for God daily, not even ten minutes, a quick reading and a prayer. They don't do it. Uh, they've relaxed into, oh well I'll do it at weekend or um, some other time. Actually God longs for more than that. I hesitate to say, but he requires more than that. He wants to be involved in everything we do. He wants us to talk to him. He wants to tell us about his vision for us, his perfect plan for us. Do you know what this is? Philippa goes to work four days a week. And she leaves at about 8 o'clock in the morning. And she gets home about 6 o'clock. And by the time 6 o'clock comes, I'm like an excited... You know, the dog's excited because he hears the car arrive. And uh, we're both of us excited. Me and the dog. We're waiting there for Philippa to come. Me, him so he can jump up at her, perhaps <laughs> lick her or something. And me, just... <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. I just want to talk. I just want to talk to her. I just want to tell her about what's been going on, and I just want to be with her. And it's like that with God and us. He wants to be close to us. So Hosea's message is that God wants Israel to know Him like that for individuals to have a relationship. He wants them to experience his love for them in tangible ways, to truly know him in order that their hearts, their thinking may be transformed, in order that they may return his love. Just like Paul says in Romans chapter 12, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He wants us to be transformed into his family again. He even says, priests don't know him. He says again in verse 6, Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests, because you have ignored the law of your God. Many priests of that time were not concerned about God's standards anymore. They ignored the laws. It's a bit like that today, isn't it? Many vicars and church leaders don't know God. You know, it's a bit of a jolt when someone's been a vicar for 10 or 20 years and then somehow meets Jesus and feels that he or she has to tell the church he, he's been playing at it for the last 10 or 20 years. But there are many who just want church. They don't want God. And I have to tell you, in quite personal moments, fellow members of the clergy have told me this. All they want is church, getting dressed up in their robes, processing down the aisle with the choir, being a public figure. They're not that interested in all this serious stuff that people like you get involved in, Bloom. They don't want... They don't want anything that's going to disturb them or rattle their cage... They want morning service over in less than an hour, full communion and a five-minute encouraging sermon, then down the pub for a gin and tonic with their friends before lunch. I know priests who their Sunday morning is like that. 
Well, they might in obedience to the bishop. They might lead and they might read a daily service out of a book. But how many of them seek to know God? I am encouraged, actually, to hear in recent years a number of clergy who've said that as they persisted in saying the daily office, the each day that we're supposed to do by canon law, they have heard God come to them and break in and speak to them. And I find that very encouraging. But there are lots who don't want God and they shut up God. They put a barrier against God. You know, Israel... They've done that. They put a barrier up to God. And Hosea constantly exposes the hypocrisy of Israel's worship. He repeatedly tells them how they're ignoring God's law. Not just in chapter 4, but this one, eight, verse 1, chapter 8, verse 1. He says, put the trumpet to your lips. An eagle is over the house of the Lord. Because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law. Because of this ignorance of God's law, they go through forms of worship but do not respond to God or their neighbour. As God says in chapter 6, verse 6, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. So he's saying, I don't want religion. I don't want you doing your great, fantastic services. I want genuine heart engagement that results in people, the poor, the outcasts, being loved and welcomed and restored. Now, you know, I don't know if I've said it to you before, but I'm, I'm quite shocked by the, the level of faith of some of the clergy. As a former DDO, I encountered a number of people in my college visits to uh, theological colleges around the country where they were obviously not all that interested in a, a living, a relationship with a living God. And their morality often reflected that. Like the four students who were suspended for a year in the same college, two men and two women, because they were found to be having an affair with the same university chaplain. I don't know how the man had the energy, personally. Um, <laughs> But he was sacked, and they just had a year off. And then they presumably went back and are now ordained. There is a tide nowadays that says, well, let's just modify the laws, God's laws, because we're uncomfortable with them. Why not modify these laws about adultery, homosexuality, gender? Why not ignore God's word and agree that God was a woman after all. I was quite shocked uh, recently to hear um, a chaplain from one of the country's top colleges uh, discussing uh, with the former bishop of Rochester on the radio about God. And she was really pressing for God being called she. She. And I, I, I'm not sure what that's about, really, because God, uh, Jesus calls God Father. Jesus is a man. You know, why, you know I, I think, to be honest, God is sexless in reality. He's above human sexuality. But why suddenly push for God to be she? That sounds a bit like revenge, doesn't it? Or getting something that makes us feel valued after all in a way, and putting us above men. But it's nothing new, this, you know. Remember Ishtar, I mentioned earlier? You know, there have been lots of female deities uh, where people have followed that deity above all gods. Ishtar, Asherah, same sort of god, really, as Diana of the Ephesians and uh, the Greek goddess of love, or should I say sex, Aphrodite. A lot of their statues look the same. Because there was no fear of God and God's law was rejected, abuse of the poor was rife. They refused to care for the poor, but they still went to the temple. It was actually a charade. Actually, they thought they were okay in their heart of hearts. They didn't realize they were, they were numbed to the situation. And not 
just because of their blatant refusal to hear God, because, but because of all this messing about with other gods, such as Baal and so on. Chapters, uh, chapter 9, verses 10 and 11 says this, When I found Israel, I should say when I first found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your ancestors, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. They were refreshing. They were alive. And it continues. But when they came to Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. This Baal of Peor was the god of the Moabites. Peor was a mountain. And the Moabites introduced this worship of the Baal to the Israelites. You can read about it in Numbers 25 if you've got some time. So alongside the temple worship, from that point on really, they had a tendency to worship Baal. Baal, that's how it should be pronounced. Not Baal. Baal. And in Israel, they worshipped in a place called Bethel, and uh, you've heard about this already, uh, the house of God, but really it was beth Avon, the house of evil, and at a place called Gilgal. For chapter 4, verse 15, God tells them, do not go to Gilgal, do not go to beth Avon, the house of evil. And in 9.15, God says, because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there. Uh, it's a bit shocking for us to hear that God hates people. And perhaps that word is, it doesn't really reflect. It's almost as if his anger, his wrath burns against them. The worship of Baal that some of them picked up from the Moabite song, Mount Peor, was highly sexualized, as we've talked about already. I believe we need to ask questions, you know, about the sexualization of our culture, and especially our young people. Computers. I mean, what are they watching on their computers? What about novels that they're reading? Um, Philippa was telling me in the car on the way here, I think, yesterday, that she'd looked up short stories, I think, on Amazon. And there were literally dozens of books produced of really sexualized stories. Uh, this stuff is out there in vast quantities. We need to be on our guard against this because it actually breaks God's law, but it also means that we're being enticed away to s worshipping something else. Also, God, it, it seems, feels betrayed by the desire of the Israelites to seek military and political alliances with Egypt and Assyria instead of relying on his protection. For example, Hosea 7, verses 10 and 11. Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. Verse 11, Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless, now calling to Egypt now turning to Assyria. Rather than trusting God, in God, they trusted in their own poor judgment. And we could ask, what do we trust in? Do we trust in human powers or do we trust in the Lord? Of course, because the Israelites didn't trust in God, they were eventually beaten militarily by the Syrian, uh, Assyrians, as Hosea had predicted. Many people, you know, we've mentioned Nigel Farage, so let's continue down that line. There are many people fearful about leaving the European Union, and it appears that's going to happen, doesn't it? What will become of us, lots of people are saying. Perhaps there are hard times ahead. But one hopes that in those times of struggle, our people will again seek the Lord you know, there was a time when Britain was great. 
with a very Christian, God-centered motivation. I know that we did things wrong. Our colonialism is not a good story. But I think there were some good things that we did. You just ask people from around the world who are grateful that lots of British missionaries went and gave their lives for the sake of the gospel. But we've gone in the wrong direction. I think we need to pray concertedly that our people will again seek Jesus. Having observed God's anger at the behavior of the, of the Israelites, it's clear throughout Hosea that God has a vision for the rescue of his people. God's desire to have his people back is clear. In chapter 1, Gomer's third child is to be called Lo Ami, which means not my people. Because of Israel's unfaithfulness, God was ready to reject them. But in verses 10 and 11, already in the same chapter, there's an almost, well, there's a remarkable change of heart by God. And he says, Yet the Israelites will be like the sand of the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called the children of the living God. The people of Judah, he continues, and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Now, I think this points forward to the day of Isaiah's prophecy of the coming Messiah, when Israel will be reunited and people will be called children of the living God. One person here asked me uh, last night, uh, so are we now Israel or something like that? And uh, I don't believe, I need to be clear about this, I don't believe that the church has replaced Israel because I don't think that truly reflects what the scripture teaches. I think Israel is alive and well, actually. Um, but I think the true Israel are those who have received the Messiah, Jesus, I think they are the true Israel of God. And those of us Gentiles who are not Jewish, we've been grafted into that olive tree, that vine, if you like. The olive tree, the vine, Jesus uses the vine, the Old Testament uses the olive tree. It's the same thing. We're grafted in to this movement of the people of God who know God by faith and believe in his son who came into the world. Throughout the prophecy, God shows his desire to bring his people back to him. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, he says, I will punish her for the day she burned incense to the Baals. She decked herself with rings and jewellery and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, declares the Lord. Therefore, what do you think he's going to say? I'm going to beat her? No. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond, as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. You know, achor means trouble. Through all the troubles that God's people go through for their failure to hear God and obey him, he will lead them, God will lead them. In the same way that Hosea was told in chapter 3 to go, to get Gomer, to pay her debts and restore her, God, it seems, wants to allure his wayward people and speak gently to them and to bring them back, to bring back the lost. Now, God, I think, is wanting to draw back wayward people, those who've lost their way, perhaps drifting deeper and deeper into sin. Perhaps you know people like that, who've given up on God, who've walked away, for one reason or another. We can have a variety of reasons. I certainly know people who have done that. Old friends, children. 
Some Christians, it's even their parents have given up on God after a life of serving him. People who once believed. Well, God longs for those people to return. And like Hosea, we may be called to let go of our pride and to risk being slapped in the face. By going and saying to them, the Lord loves you and he wants you back. Now, can you contemplate that? I'm thinking of one particular friend who I know has rejected God and has gone far away. One of my friends from Chatham days. And I was saying to Philippa in the car coming over, I've just got to see him. I've got to tell him that the Lord still loves him. Because I remember when he sang passionate songs of love to the Lord. But what's gone now? What's gone wrong? As I speak, the Lord may lay someone on your heart. Someone who he wants you to build a bridge with for him. To reach out to that lost loved one. Let's just have a moment of quiet, shall we, as we take this on board. Lord, I ask that you will make us to be a people who have a living relationship with you. Lord, help us not to put you in a box. Help us, Lord, not to limit or restrict what we allow you to do. Lord, help us to be those who are ready to be asked to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. Lord, we ask that you'll help us to grow in our depth of desire to be in your presence. Lord, we ask that you'll help us to grow in our desire to read your word, to hear your word, to act on your word, to seek you with our whole heart. And Lord, we do pray for those we know who've walked away those who perhaps they've been hurt or perhaps for some reason they've blamed you for something. Lord, we don't know what it is, but we, we plead for those who are far away. But Lord, we ask that you'll help us to see how we can be part of your prophetic voice to them. Lord, we thank you that when we steer off track, you long for us to get back on track, to be close to you and to know you. And we pray, Lord, that as a consequence of this weekend, that you will give us a fresh desire <coughs> as individuals and as a church to seek you and not to limit you. So, Lord, we pray that by your Spirit you will be at work here among us today. Let's stand, shall we?